Good evening and welcome to Rel Talks, our second version of Rel Talks today. So a series where we are having up and coming relationship scholars talk about their expertise and sharing that with the world. So my name is Eric Goodcase. I'm a member of Relevate. We are a multidisciplinary team of researchers and practitioners dedicated to increasing access to research upon scholarship. So this is the second in our presentation series. And our presenter for today is Paige McAllister. Paige is a second year PhD student at Kansas State University in the Couple and Family Therapy Program. Her research is on sexual and relationship violence with a focus on trauma and healing and sexual identity development. Paige is passionate about comprehensive sexual and relationship education. She has taught sex ed to teens and undergraduate students throughout her graduate career and incorporates her sexual and relational justice lens into her educational style. She is developing a clinical specialty in complex trauma and feminist therapy. In her roles as a therapist, educator, researcher, and clinical supervisor. Paige seeks to affect systemic change on how humans treat themselves and other humans. In her free time, Paige likes cooking with her partner, true crime podcasts, and in non-COVID time, before everything went on, occasionally traveling. And on a personal note, I am really excited to see Paige talk about this. Um, I have heard her speak about self-compassion before, and even though I've heard it before, I am excited to hear it. Um, she's a very brilliant person, and I'm looking forward to it. So Paige, without further ado, no one wants to hear me talk anymore, so I'm going to hand it over to you in a second. For anyone who is listening, please keep your um, self muted and keep your video off. Um, if you have any questions, you can ask them at any time. Just type them into chat, so you'll see your chat feature at the bottom there. Just go ahead and click on that, type it in. I will receive all the chats and I can relay to Paige the questions when she's finished. So feel free to ask them at any time. But without further ado, Paige, take it from here. Okay. All right. I did practice sharing my screen. All right. Uh, thank you so much for being here today. And thank you for that introduction, which I did write mostly myself. Um, I'm very excited to talk to you about self-compassion today. Self-compassion is something that I kind of happened into when I was an undergrad. There was a self-compassion group at the university I was going to and I kind of started going and I remember distinctly the light bulb moment of when I realized that I was being such a jerk to myself and I didn't have to be. I, to get where I wanted to go in life and to accomplish my goals, I didn't have to shame and belittle myself into doing good things for myself. I could trust myself to make good decisions for myself. And of course, because I'm human, my behavior didn't automatically change in any way, but it did open a door for me to start considering what it would look like to be on my own team and to be a friend to myself rather than a bully. Fast forward a couple of years and I became a therapist. Well, I started doing therapy and I realized that I was hearing such similar things from my clients and that as the objective person in the room, I had a clearer view of all the obstacles they were facing and all the difficult things that they were managing really well. I also started to recognize that those ways that we talk to each other, to ourselves are often like emotional abuse. Like if a couple came in and they were talking to each other the way my clients were talking about themselves, I would feel like ethically I had to step in and say something. And that for me is what really solidified um, self-compassion as the heart of everything that I do as a clinician and as a supervisor. Um, so today I'm really excited to talk to you about what it is, why it's not intuitive, why we do other things instead of self-compassion, and then specifically what a self-compassion practice would look like. It's become something of a meme that 2020 is a dumpster fire of a year. But that feels very much like a, we're gonna laugh about this so we don't cry all the time about it. So I wanna start 
this presentation by just taking a second for you to check in with yourself about what's felt difficult this year or this month or this week or today. And to think about how have you been treating yourself? What things have you been saying to yourself? Just in general, when life gets hard, how do you treat yourself? If we could quantify the suffering of one human, one way that we could quantify it potentially is both the negative emotional experience plus the struggle against the negative emotional experience. And in this context, when I say negative, I don't mean morally bad, I mean uncomfortable. So these are the feelings that if we had a choice, we'd rather not feel like sadness and worry and loneliness and rejection and frustration and disappointment. These things aren't fun to feel. So often what our default is, is to struggle against the negative emotion. We do all sorts of mental and emotional gymnastics to try to get out of feeling it. And if you've engaged in some of those mental and emotional gymnastics, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a second, you know that that actually requires a lot of, a ment of mental and emotional work. That that's a lot of energy that we're expending to not feel the emotion. And what ends up happening is we amplify the uncomfortable feelings. We don't get out of feeling the feeling, first of all. And then we've also exerted a bunch of energy on top of that. And often we use criticism and judgment as a tool to try to get out of those feelings. Self-compassion is a way to turn down the struggle, to be able to sit with ourselves in our negative emotional experience without judgment, without doing all the tricks to get out of it. And that's how we reduce some of the total suffering. We still feel the feelings, but we don't, um, we don't struggle against them. I know that I care more about the research than most people, so this will be so short. We know that self-compassion works. It's associated with greater overall psychological health in general, as well as in times of extra stress or failure. More importantly though, we know that we can learn to be more self-compassionate and that it's something that we can practice and that we can get better at over time. So it's not, you're either born with self-compassion or you're not, and hopefully you got the, <laughs> the good end of that stick or whatever the expression is. Um, this is something that we can develop. We can learn how to do this. First, let's talk about what we do instead. So in terms of mental gymnastics, um, we might be critical or judgmental. We tell ourselves all sorts of mean things about what a horrible person we are for feeling upset about whatever's happening. We minimize. We say, oh, this is such an overreaction. Like what is happening is not even that big of a deal. And here you are having a total meltdown over nothing. We compare ourselves to others, either the total experience we see other people as always coping in really great ways and we're the people over here who just can't handle life or we compare specific struggles. So we say to ourselves, I don't know why you're losing it over this little thing when other people in the world are dealing with ginormous problems compared to yours. Well, one of my least favorites is, and I don't think I made up this term, but toxic positivity. This, I will just focus on the positive. Essentially what we're saying here is that I can tell myself how to feel and I tell myself to feel positive feelings. It doesn't work um, if you have an experience where you did tell yourself how to feel and then you felt that thing, feel free to email me and correct me, but yeah, this one, it's not effective. The other thing that we, that uh, the other like code word for this is having an attitude adjustment which I hate, <laughs> I hate the term because people don't generally mean, I'm gonna choose an attitude of honoring my feelings and working to overcome obstacles. Generally what they mean is, I'm just gonna change my emotional state through my willpower and that doesn't work. Emotions are very much like whack-a-mole. If we push them down somewhere, they're just gonna pop up somewhere else. 
We also do a lot of emotional gymnastics. We suppress our emotions and we deny them. So we shove them down as hard as we can into little boxes that we put into bigger boxes. And then we put those boxes on shelves and then we put those shelves in closets and we never open the door. Or we can avoid and distract. There are a million things that you can do instead of feeling your feelings. And we find really great ways to find all those things to do. Sometimes we choose to numb our emotions with whatever your substance of choice is, whether it's an actual substance or Netflix or TikTok or food. The problem being that we don't get to numb only the things we don't wanna feel. If we choose numbing, we numb it all, including the things that we would like to feel. And sometimes we misdirect and project. This is when we see someone else expressing the emotion that we're feeling and we feel resentful that <laughs> they're getting to express their emotions and we don't get to express our emotions we might lash out or we might turn that judgmental voice from ourselves onto other people so i'm sure you saw yourself somewhere in this list truly i just chose mine <laughs> these are the gymnastics that I do um, put them out there for the world to see. Um, but as you can see, like this takes a lot of work because most usually we do a combination of many or all or whatever I didn't list that's on your list. This takes a lot of energy and it doesn't take care of or resolve the emotion just pushes it down so it can pop up somewhere else. So instead of the gymnastics, we can do self-compassion, which as a theory has three components. The first is mindfulness. And like all mindful, if you're familiar at all with mindfulness and mindfulness activities, this is just bringing awareness to the emotional experience and all the thoughts and sensations and behaviors and emotions that are going on right now. The second part of self-compassion is loving kindness. And this is the part where we're choosing to be kind instead of critical and choosing curiosity, like wondering what our emotions are about instead of being judgmental. And the last part of self-compassion is common humanity. And I think this is one of the most important parts and also one of the one of the unique pieces that self-compassion brings into emotion coping, common humanity is recognizing that emotions don't mean that I'm defective or that something, something's going wrong. He, emotions mean that my humanity is online. If I'm a human and things happen in the world around me, I'm gonna have an emotional response to it. That's what humans do. So this isn't about me. This is about being a human. Common humanity is also about recognizing that suffering is universal. That suffering, that going through difficult things is a part of our experience as humans. And so it's not something that we get to opt out of. Now there's an asterisk here because while suffering is universal, different types of suffering are not. And we, my context is very, I, I'm living in Kansas in the United States. So that's the society that I'm most familiar with, but there are types of suffering that are, that have either overtones or undertones of racism and sexism and homophobia and transphobia and ageism and ableism and all the isms and all the phobias. And the struggle and the suffering that results from those things, the isms and the phobias, that's not universal. So when we talk about making this a practice, we have to use common humanity in a way that makes sense and feels safe. Turning this into a practice is just making these into steps. I know it's not very imaginative, but it works. So while this can be a very quick thing that um, we can learn to 
uh, to do in a moment of stress where we can just like check in with ourselves and offer some compassion and move along. I think it is really helpful to at least once or twice go through this process in depth and take as much time as you need and either write it down or say it out loud to yourself or do whatever fits for you, but to really go deep on this practice. And then once you've practiced it a couple times in depth, it's much easier to do in a quick format. So the first step is mindfulness. And like any other mindful, mindful practice that you've done, it starts with a deep breath, however many deep breaths you want. And then we're gonna pay attention. And because you have a human brain that doesn't always concentrate very well, you start naming the things that you're paying attention to. So once you notice an emotion, a thought, a behavior, or where in your body you feel that emotion, you name it. So I feel, I feel sad. I know I feel sad because I feel it here in my body. And when I feel sad, I want to X, Y, and Z. And because we are, we're gonna push ourselves to go beyond emotions like upset. Like I feel upset or I feel bad or don't feel good. And we're gonna go into what's under all of that. What do I actually feel sad about? And those vulnerable kind of uncomfortable parts that get into our yearnings to belong and to succeed and our fears about if that's true, right? In the loving kindness step, we turn towards our emotional experience and we throw all the love that we can at it. So this is saying things like, that is, that is so much to deal with. That is so much, that must be so heavy. That must be so hard. This is a really exhausting time for you. We're validating our experience. And if this part's awkward, think about how you talk to your friends and your family and people you love. When they say things like, oh, I'm just feeling really overwhelmed and anxious, you probably don't say things like, yeah, but, <laughs> right, we, we're more validating. So at, I know you can do it because I know you do it for other people. You're going to access that for yourself. And then in the common humanity step, you're just going to remind yourself that this is how humans respond to difficult things. This isn't because I'm defective. This is because this is hard. And this is how humans respond when things are hard. And if what you're processing some emotions about is from those isms and phobias, you remind yourself that this is how humans respond to racism or sexism or any of the other isms and phobias. This is, this is how humans respond to injustice or discrimination. Now, I want to be very clear that these are not pages three steps to get out of feeling your emotions. You're gonna to get to the end of the common humanity step and you're probably still gonna feel whatever you were feeling at the beginning. Emotions are a ride that once you get on, you don't get to bail halfway through. You are on that ride till the end. Self-compassion is a way to keep your hands and your arms and your legs inside the ride so that more pain doesn't happen. This is a way to honor our emotions, sit with them, to sit with our humanity, to treat ourselves um, with compassion rather than judgment. If, because I know you want to, if you want to boost this practice, here's some options. The first one, people get real this is, they're like, oh, I was with you and now you lost me, but just try it. You can give yourself a hug, put your hands over your heart or on your face or somewhere in your body that you feel like tension or discomfort. Or you can look at yourself in the mirror and make more, make a more tangible connection with yourself. Be like, hey self, I really, I'm here. We are, we're here. I'm here in this with you. 
the next logical like step from common humanity is to actually reach out to someone, potentially someone who might share in your feelings or someone who feels um, safe to be vulnerable with, right? Like suffering is a universal human experience, but not all humans are gonna be able to handle your suffering. And I think this is also the perfect time to ask yourself, what do you need? Self-compassion can slow, because it's a mindful process, it can slow down like our thinking and our feeling. Um, and then we can ask, what, what do I need? And speaking of needs, this is my very small uh, self-care talk. I don't just mean like pampering your body. I'm not just talking about bubble baths. I'm talking about how you as a human have a wide variety of needs across different dimensions of your life. And so checking in, how am I feeling in my relationships? How am I feeling in my environment? How am I feeling with my physical and my nutritional needs, my spiritual needs, my sensory needs? And do I need to have some conversations with myself or some conversations with other people to really get those needs met? To close, in case you needed it, here's your permission slip. I, I think we often think as humans, I know I did, that if I wasn't, if I just left myself to my own devices, if I was, if, if I was kind, that's so self-indulgent, I'll never get anything done. I'll never do good things. I'll just uh, sit on the couch eating pizza and watching Netflix all day. Like that's what I would do. When we love and accept ourselves, we know that we don't just want to sit on the couch eating Netflix or <laughs> watching Netflix and eating pizza. We can, for the days when we do need to do that, we can hold up judgment and say, you know what, self, you need this. And then going back to these other needs we have, we can get out into the world and, and do what we want to do. But in case you're wondering or feeling some reservation about it, I give you permission. And I hope that one day that we can all get to a place where we um, where we feel empowered to love ourselves and accept ourselves. Um, but until, until you get there or um, just if you need it, you have my permission as a trained mental health professional to do it. And that's what, that's what I've got. So we can, I think, I, yeah, I left a couple minutes for questions. So if you guys have questions, great job, by the way, Paige. We really appreciate it. Oh. I downloaded that while you were talking. So um, <laughs> that was what I was doing. Um, so if you guys have questions for Paige, anything related to self-compassion, go ahead and open up chat on the bottom of your screen. And, um, and uh, go ahead and type it in. Uh, while I'm waiting for questions to come in, well, first of all, um, we have a comment from Shelby saying, I'm not crying, you're crying. So you got some people on an emotional level um, or I denying try. it an emotional level. So um, <laughs> or maybe a better way to say that. Um, but while we're waiting for questions, I was gonna actually pose a question for you. And I was mm -hmm. just thinking about um, for the people in our lives who we see this and who are especially intimate with, whether it's a friend, a romantic partner or our own children, how would you help them kind of like take that first step into self-compassion other than sending them the video to your talk? What would be your suggestion to kind of like help them take the first step? Um, well, I'll tell you what I do with my clients. Um, I show them what compassion looks like and just throw as much compassion at their experience as I can. And when I hear shame things, when they say things that are similar to well, I shouldn't be feeling this way. I say, no, no. <laughs> Humans feel sad. Humans feel angry. Humans feel disappointed and lonely. Um, but I think it starts with modeling 
that self-compassion. And um, I don't remember who I got this from. Oh, I hate it when people do that, but I don't get to do it. Poorly remembered quote. Um, something I often say is don't talk about my friend like that. <laughs> like that person you're talking about is my friend and you're saying really horrible things. Excellent. So we have a question from Christina. What do you do when loved ones don't understand that self-compassion might mean setting boundaries and not doing all the things they expect? Great question. Yes, this is a great one. So the part two of this presentation is talking about how there's two sides of self-compassion. There is the side of self-compassion that on the most basic level, I am going to be kind instead of mean to myself. And then the second level is if I love myself and accept myself, then there's a lot of stuff I'm not going to deal with. Like I am going to have to set boundaries. I have to protect myself. Just like I would protect someone else I love, I have to protect myself. Um, self-compassion doesn't make that easier. Like setting boundaries is a difficult thing, but self-compassion can then help me with, if I set boundaries and someone responds in a negative way, then I have tools to handle. Like, what does it feel like to set a boundary and have someone just shoot it down? And maybe that really, I lose that relationship or that relationship is altered. Um, but I have the tools to handle the emotions that come with that. So being slightly more immune to the guilt trip, maybe, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> maybe. <knowing what's> <laughs> yeah. So um, this is a question from Serene. She says, loved this. Thinking about painful experiences and trauma can uh, feel like dwelling on something that makes us feel worse. How do I balance between confronting painful experiences and sitting with a negative experience versus like dwelling or going um, too far, maybe? That is a great, great question. The key is we're going to focus on the emotions rather than like the traumatic event. I, because I mostly work with trauma, self-compassion is what I, I teach all my clients. And we have to talk a lot about self-compassion is what I use for when I'm feeling triggered, when I have a trauma response. And I remind myself that this is how humans respond to trauma that something really difficult happened and that I am still struggling with, with this or I'm still feeling feelings about this doesn't mean I can't handle life. It means I've gone through trauma. Um, it, it dwelling, I mean, this is coming also from my therapeutic lens, but ha having like a therapist to help someone determine like how do I stay in self-compassion for my feelings and um while working to resolve like the flashbacks or you know the things about trauma that are intrusive um that would be my suggestion but self-compassion is for the emotions it's for the um uh, and it's for the part of trauma that makes us feel like we are literally losing our minds and that we aren't in control and these things that we want to move on from we can't move on from self-compassion can help with that part when we remind ourselves that this is as much as it is difficult this is what trauma looks like all right we got two more questions for you uh so you're if you're uh still have a question you're running out of time to type it in a uh, question from brecken could self-compassion used over time become a coping mechanism for uh, things like anxiety, depression? What would help those things improve over time? Yes, <laughs> and the research shows so. So the study that I uh, cited that showed, that I used to show that we can learn self-compassion was um, an experiment where they taught people they went through a little self-compassion course and then they tracked mental health outcomes over time. Um, I would say if there's, I mean, anytime there's something serious in a mental health way going on, talk to a professional, but feeling depressed or feeling anxious is a very normal human experience. We all deal with periods of feeling down and periods of feeling worried. Um, and for that, self-compassion definitely can help us like over time, um, learn how to, it might not resolve 
the anxiety and the depression because feeling those feelings is a part of being a human. So we're still going to feel anxious. Even if we have all the coping skills in the world and we've done a million years of therapy, we'll still feel anxious sometimes. Um, but self-compassion can definitely help us when we're in a period of feeling depressed or anxious to turn to ourselves and say, hey, self, here we are again. And I'm going to be with you through this instead of beating you up when you're down. Excellent. So a question from Chase, uh, you talked about how humans, as humans, we are emotional creatures. What do you have to say about people who say they don't have emotions uh, or they might say self-compassion is not for me? What would you say to your, the critics of emotions? Um, people who say they don't have emotions, uh, they're probably just really good at pushing them down is my initial gut reaction. Um, another one that I get sometimes is people who say, well, I only feel angry, sad, and happy. Like they have a very limited range of like emotions they can name and recognize. And I, and that's how I work with it as a therapist is I, I'm thinking of how safe has it been for that person to show emotions in their childhood or now, um, in what ways were they or were they not taught to talk about and express emotions? So I have a lot of compassion for people who tell me they don't have emotions. Um, mostly though, I would say I get pushed back on um, that idea that if I was kind to myself, I would never get anything done. Um, and then we process like, and who said you had to be a jerk to yourself <laughs> to get things done. All right, last question. Uh, this is from Christina. She said, I really enjoyed this. I don't think there is anyone who wouldn't benefit from more self-compassion and kindness, uh, preach. When someone, say one of your clients is beginning to practice self-compassion when they're just kind of starting out, do you have a favorite resource that you like to share with them? I do. So um, Kristen Neff has a website. I'm actually, I will put it in the chat right now. Sorry, cannot type and talk at the same time. There we go. Pretty sure it's self-compassion.org. You could also search self-compassion Kristen Neff. I'll put her name in there as well. Um, so she has written exercises and she also has self-compassion like guided meditations if you're into guided meditations and visualizations. I think it's a great place to start. Uh, I do have it. <laughs> I always had this close to me. This is the Mindful Self-Compassion Workbook and it's by Kristen Neff and Christopher Germer. Um, and again, it's just activities, um, both journaling or things on your own or um, meditations that you can do. So those are the ones that I most often suggest. Excellent. And Christina thanks you as well. So in addition to that, thank you. I think I speak for all of us in attendance and those who might be watching in the future by saying thank you, Paige, for sharing your expertise and all this information with us. It's something that I feel like is, um, like uh, Christina said in the last question, is something we can all kind of benefit from and doing it a little bit more in our lives. And um, it's something we all can kind of grow from. And thank all of you for coming. Uh, you have another thank you from Hannah Mori as well. So. Um, Thank you all for coming. Thank you for watching. Thank you for coming. Uh, if you are in attendance, you will have a short survey to fill out sent to your email. So if you guys wouldn't mind filling that out and giving us some feedback, we would absolutely love that. Uh, and if you are interested, be sure to tune in next week for part three of Rel Talks. We have Shaylin Randolph talking about uh, destigmatizing therapy in communities of color. So thank you guys so much and have a great rest of your day.